All right. Um, today's topic uh, is Roaring Twenties. Um, we uh, kind of connected to this at the very end of, of the um, lecture on, on World War One and sort of like the transitions after World War I. Um, but just kind of like to jump backwards and remind you just some simple things. Uh, remember like the Red Scare stuff going on. Um, the Spanish flu that broke out at, at the end of this, this, uh, at the end of World War I, um, that this is, these race riots will, in, in this recession will, will be important later on. Just, I'm, I'm just trying to go through this and connect this back because we're going to kind of allude to this as we roll through this, um, talking about problems with labor unions and, and, and so on. Um, like I said, the Red Scare, uh, and, and these Palmer raids that are going to happen as far as like trying to go through and, and, um, find uh, sort of suspected radicals in, in American society. Um, in, in the Sacco and Vanzetti case, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back and talk about that. I, I think it's interesting that like the 20s is, is, is called the Roaring 20s and, and not, you know, kind of making a joke here with the line. Um, but I, I think it is, is interesting because in, in, in many ways this is, this is a difficult question to answer because because for, for part of the population, it, it, it undoubtedly did roar um, in that uh, there was an immense amount of, of economic and, and, and cultural uh, changes and, and just just uh, for certain parts of the populations that, that, that had money. Um, and so like this sort of moniker uh, of the Roaring Twenties is, is appropriate in that sense. But I, I think what gets really often overblown is that you know, during this time period, like forty percent of the, the population uh, was impoverished, in, in so if you have forty percent of your population uh, sort of struggling through poverty, um, you know what to what extent can you really say that a, a decade was is roaring um, in a sort of general fashion? Um, and the twenties is 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 not just even interesting because that, but I just think it's it's maybe one of those really critical times. Um, I think in many ways, like we're experiencing now, where um, it's just like a decade of contradictions, uh, and then we'll kind of talk about that. It's is this interesting sort of um, decade of both uh, huge amounts of change, but then like really strong reactions to those changes, and in 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 reactions and trying to sort of maintain the status quo, whether that be like anti-immigration, whether that be like anti-science and, and increased religiosity, um, and in all of the other, you know, you talk about anti, um, you know, minorities, uh, and, and so we'll, t we'll talk about that as we go through it, but just sort of note that in the back of your mind of like this, of this, you know, maybe a, instead of calling it the Roaring Twenties is, is, is maybe to think of it really as this sort of debt, decade of, of contradictions um on uh the powerpoint yesterday uh i i noted this and this is kind of where we left off was that it, it's interesting that harding um gets elected president in in 1920 um his campaign slogan was return to normalcy um if you look in a, a dictionary uh, normalcy is not a word just in, in case you're wondering so the, it's uh he sort of makes up a word to get in uh, elected president, but what what's what's important about that is that he uh, he sort of plays on this fact that like there was so much um, how do I don't want to say this like uh, and you read about this yesterday there was so much sort of I don't like revolutionary spirits is way too strong of a word but like there's a lot of just sort of uneasiness uh, in tension in society based on. Uh, sort of the war, and then then like the outcomes of the war, and then you have the the Spanish flu, and then you have all the economic problems that come from the end of the war, and, and that like then because of like all this building up, you see this huge growth in, in socialism in in America. And, um, the reaction to that is, is 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 maybe just as strong. So what we see in the in the in twenties um, is that you know the three presidents that are elected, Harding, um, Coolidge, and and Hoover. Uh, are all incredibly re um, uh, Republican and, and very, very conservative. Um, and so these these very fiscally conservative and, and very sort of um, sort of socially conservative presidents are going to be elected in, in order in the 1920s. 
And, and their sort of big thing was that they wanted to, uh, they sort of favored big business and they wanted to reduce government intervention in regulations of business. Uh, they're going to believe really strongly in, in laissez-faire government, which uh, in sort of a simple way just means like government keeps its um, sort of hands off or government sort of deregul deregulation of, of, of government over business. Um, and that's an important term to note. So, so that laissez-faire uh, is something that you should know. Um, Hardy doesn't have a very long presidency, okay? So he uh, unfortunately dies uh, in 1923, so he doesn't even... Um, live out a full term, uh, but it, unfortunately his, his short presidency was also plagued by scandals, um, and one of the biggest scandals of the 1900s, probably outside of, of the Watergate scandal, um, was the Teapot Dome scandal uh, that was uncovered during his presidency, where his uh, Secretary of Interior um, took uh, basically massive bribes to sell oil that was supposed to be uh, intended for the Navy, um, uh, these oil reserves intended for the Navy, he sold them to private companies for like half a million dollars, which at that time was a huge sum of money. Um, and, and so, you know, it's it's unfortunate, and, and, and Coolidge is, is often a forgotten president because, I mean, he has such a short presidency, and um, there, there's not very many positives that, that come over that. Um his, so his vice, when, when uh, Harding dies, uh, Coolidge takes over. Um, Coolidge is basically like a spitting image of Harding as far as his ideas go. He's going to continue Harding's like pro-business policies. He's going to support big business and limited government regulations, basically all the same stuff. Coolidge has this really fa you see that right in front of you on the screen. Like Coolidge has this very famous quote um, which says, man who builds a factory builds a temple. Um and, and that kind of shows uh, Coolidge's uh, sort of reverence for business and the effect that like business would, would have on, on America. Um, and so when we look at these uh, economic policies, um, it's hard to argue that they were not successful and it's even hard to argue that they weren't like in, incredibly successful as far as like what they were intended to do. I mean, the country's gonna see, see huge economic growth. Um, uh, corporate uh, profits are going to skyrocket. Um, even so, that in, in some ways, like those corp corporate pro profits um, do uh, trickle down to your sort of average industrial worker. I think like the the wages of an average industrial worker rise by like a, a quarter um, during the 1920s. Um, don't quote me on that though. Uh, it, it's some it's somewhere in that range. Um, and so, what? is going to happen is we're going to see massive amounts of economic growth during this time period of deregulation. Now, the problem is, is that like with this deregulation that, that does in, in some ways help sort of build on um, the economic growth that would have happened anyways with the increase in technologies and the automobile boom, which we'll talk about later. This, this, this economic growth, I think, would have, would have happened. Uh, I think like the, the role of dereg deregulation is it just accelerated it um, and pushed it maybe farther than it would have would have otherwise. But the problem is, is like as you should know, um, in less than ten years, I mean, the Great Depression is going to start, and in, in this deregulation of, of the financial sector in, in big business, um, and in the ability uh, for um, Americans to easily go into to debt, um, and, and corporations going into debt, and, and and all of that kind of stuff is all going to sort of um, build into this massive catastrophe, which is the Great Depression, and, and um, that'll be uh, next week, though. Uh, I, I think the last thing that I want to kind of note about this economic success is that like, you need to understand that like this is a story of like middle and upper class prosperity in the 1920s. Like I said, uh, there's still about 40% of the population that's going to be stuck in poverty. Um, and so this, like I was saying, this this we go back to that point, like the 1920s is this um, decade of contradiction, you know, where, you know, roughly half the population really like enjoys in this prosperity and, and, and does, in fact, um, you know, the decade does roar for, for the middle and upper classes. It's, it's, it's not the case for everyone, so I don't want you to generalize that. Um, if you, we want to look at some of the other economic changes during this time period, um, 
in, 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 in some small ways in order to protect American businesses from European competition as Europe sort of got back on its feet after World War One, is that tariff rates are going to be pushed um, from roughly like 30%, which is really high, um, to roughly like 40%, which is ridiculously high. Uh, and, and, and you should know, I mean, tariff rates are important because what it does is uh, essentially is it, it, it it disallows European goods from competing with American goods, and so it, it, it as the economy is going to grow, and it's especially as as um, uh, the the sort of consumer uh, power as 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 they make more money uh, grows, um, is that they're increasingly going to focus on American goods just because American goods were, were goods were the cheapest. Now you also need to understand that like not only does this impede sort of Europe's post World War One economic growth because it slows trade. Um, it's also going to have really important economic effects on Europe, which we're going to talk about on this next slide, um, with uh, sort of the economic problems in Europe after World War One, and we can kind of if you, you should have talked about this in your world history class because a lot of that ties into like the growth of Nazism in, in Germany and and many of the problems that are going to lead towards World War One or what sorry excuse me World War Two in Europe. So like this helps America, but in you know. At what cost? Uh, it it basically screws over um, uh, Germany, uh, and 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 we'll talk about in some ways how like then America sort of digs itself out of that plan, um, but uh, that that is like important to bring up. Um, all right, let's talk about sort of world um, America's role as like the a creditor nation in in, in the world. Um, so what? happens in the 1920s is um, the pound gets replaced by the dollar as the sort of financial uh, currency of the world and it has been that way ever since um, even when the euro was really really strong um, you know 10 15 years ago and, and continuing to, I mean in the last just in the last maybe like what three or three years um, that the the dollars made really a resurgence, but I mean anywhere from like three years ago to you know going backwards, uh, it's really to post nine eleven. Um, even when the euro was the strongest, the the dollar has always been the world currency, and so like if you trade anything in the world, and any sort of major purchases in the world are made with dollars, and that's really important because it always it it, it helps strengthen our economy. Um, that ever, and it helps strengthen the dollar um, in relation to other um, um, currencies, and th and this change happens in World War One, and that's and, and I like that you may say, well, why is he talking about that? That that's really important. Um, what's going to happen is that remember after World War One, uh, the Allied countries uh, f forced uh, Germany to pay massive reparations payments. Uh, to uh, Britain and France to help rebuild uh, Britain and France after World War One, and what ends up happening is that Germany starts defaulting on those payments. Um, and the problem with that is that, like, what was happening is that Britain and France were paying, um, um, like, because remember, America basically subsidized Britain and France during World War One, and so when Britain and France after World War One need to help start paying America back, they're they basically use German repar reparation payments to pay back America and American financial institutions, corporations, etc. So what ends up happening is that America is really smart here. And what they do is they start loaning money to Germany so that Germany can pay Britain and France and then that Britain and France can pay back America with their own money. What then is, is great about that idea, doesn't necessarily end up working out the best because of the rise of the Nazis, um, but it was a genius plan because then, like, the Germans then have to pay that money back to America that they're loaning that they're getting back anyway. So it's a big circle that they're in all roads. All money leads back to the United States. Um, and, and, and this is really, like I was saying, like, the whole, like, European problem is really important because, I mean, Germany's in, 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 in straight-up crisis mode. I mean, um, and, like, I keep going back. This, you should have talked about this in world history. I mean, we're, we, Germany gets to the point where, like, it was... It was more cost effective to burn your money um, in these big, like they would tie them up in big bricks and burn them for warmth instead of spending them. And uh, there's like these famous pictures of, of, of Germans uh, going to markets with like 
wheelbarrows full of money because you know you can only buy like a loaf of bread and 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 some milk with like a whole wheelbarrow of of of, of cash. You know, like you can see the stat there: a loaf of bread in Germany at one point cost 120 million um, German marks. All right. Um, so, and, and like I said, th those German economic problems that America is going to become very involved in um, eventually are they're not going to work. Okay. So, and and what's going to happen is that increasingly in Germany in the 1920s, like Nazism is going to become more and more um, sort of prevalent, and, and obviously leading towards Hitler and. Um, 1929-1930. Uh, um, so in, in the United States takes this really interesting role in the 1920s is sort of fluctuating between like very economically interested in what's happening in the world, but also like um, sort of being sort of passively isolationist. I mean, I think the best example of this is like the United States never sort of joins the League of Nations. And so this organization that was designed to uh, build sort of collective security in the world um, and to sort of build relationships between nations to prevent war. The United States never joins that. However, you also see that like the United States does sort of get involved in trying to create a more peaceful world. So like uh, in the 1920s, um, the United States talks uh, 62 countries into signing what was called the Kellogg-Briand Pact, uh, which 62 countries got together and signed this agreement that outlawed war, and, and they all agreed. They said, we'll never use war as a um, tool for uh, diplomacy ever again. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, within 15 years, the, the Second World War is going to start, and that seems terribly naive. But um, it, it, it's important just because it shows, like, that the U.S. foreign policy is very mixed during this time period, um, that they sort of oscillate between being very involved um, in, in trying to be a world leader and then also just kind of like, well, we are very content just to kind of hang out on our side of the Atlantic Ocean and, and not get involved in, in, in the world's problems. Um, you can kind of see the, the political cartoon there too that makes fun of uh, the United States for, for you know, sticking out of or staying out of the League of Nations. Um, I kind of alluded to this earlier is if we want to get back to some of this economic growth in the 1920s, much of this boom can be traced to the automobile. Uh, you need to understand that, um, you know, and this is what I would say is like with even even regardless of what sort of economic policies were were being sort of put put in place by presidents during that time period, the the simple fact of cheap automobiles is real. And and well, it's it's two things. It's cheap automobiles, um, and really. Uh, the 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 large scale avail availability of credit um, that are going to drive economic growth in, in the 1920s. So like, um, and you in in the reason that cars are so important, and I think like this gets like it's it's very simple. Just think, oh like, you know, the car was king um, as far as like industries go, but like, U.S. Um, the U.S. auto automobile um, uh, industry. I think at one point, like, produced like eighty percent of the the automobiles in the world in in, in the nineteen twenties, um, and think about everything that goes with that. So how much you know gasoline and oil to fuel those those cars? You have rubber for tires, the glass and fabrics that go into it, all of the highway and road constructions. I mean, all that has to have jobs. They have to build businesses around those highways and and, and roads. So like, they build gas station, they build service stations, they build restaurants, they. Um, you know, all these businesses that, I mean, even if you think about even just road clearing, so like someone's got to go through and cut down forests, then they got to, you know, um, flatten the roads and bring in, in, in soil to, to even them. And like the, the pro, like the massive amount of like industries that like built off of cars, um, it's a lot like the effect that like computers and the internet have had in the last 20 years. That it's it's not just like those simple things. It's like everything that is tied to that that causes this these huge economic um, bubbles to to develop. Um, and and really, what's relevant about cars is if, is when we look at a couple things. Is one, I mean, it's it cars had been at that point developed for 30, 40 years. The what what becomes relevant about cars in the nineteen twenties that become affordable for the first time to to the masses. Uh, and in in large part, that's because of of Henry Ford, and Henry Ford um, developed uh, the assembly line, uh, 
and, and using the assembly line to to produce vehicles. Uh, and so if you look at like the total time it costs to develop uh, or to produce a car from start to finish, it went from taking 12 hours per a car to finish to just 90 minutes using an assembly line. So from, from the first time they, they started to the finish, I mean, um, it took 90 minutes. And I think at like its height in the 1920s, uh, Ford Motors uh, was rolling out a new uh, Model T like every five seconds or something crazy like that. Um, and so it's, it's really important, like not only that, you know, they're all of the industries that are tied to it. It's just like sheer numbers, uh, that like the mass quantities of goods that they're producing. Um, the other really important effect that Henry Ford has on the American economy is that Ford was many industrial leaders during the 1920s actually hated Ford. Because Ford was notorious in, um, among business circles because he paid his workers really well, uh, which was not common at that time at all. And he also shortened their work hours. So like Ford's workers not only got paid the best, but they had like mandatory work hours that limited how much they could work a week. And, and Ford was really, really smart about this and understanding that like, you know, happier workers are more productive workers. That's like backed by, by, by scientific studies over the last you know, 100 years. Um, and, and so not only was he getting more effective and efficient work out of his, um, men that he was employing, but he also realized by paying them more that like, then he was creating a whole bunch of customers too. So by employing or by paying his employees in, uh, a, a good wage, what he was hoping is that they would use those, save some of those wages, um, over the course of a, you know, time and, and, and save them towards buying a car. Um, and, and because Ford became such a massive company, many other companies sort of had to follow suit with Ford, and that's many companies weren't really happy about it. But um, the effect of Ford on the American economy is important. I mean, you can see the stat right there um, of sort of like the average wages per year, and how you know, bef you know, basically in 1915 when World War One was start. Well, World War One started in 1914, but r around the time that World War One was starting um, to 1920. Uh, U.S. wages more than double, uh, and that's really significant in in a five year span. Is that um, you know, and a lot of that has to do with these economic shifts that were happening. Um, we've already kind of talked about how these cheap automobiles radically changed life, so I don't think I need to really talk about this. So the thing, one thing I didn't didn't mention here um, that I should have is that this also allows families to travel much more. And so we start to see in the 1920s for the, like the very first time that um, American uh, American families really start to have um, go on more vacations, and that opens a whole industry of like tourism and resorts and and all that kind of stuff. So that that does have an economic effect effect as well. Um, though, like admittedly, uh, places like Disneyland and so on, like things like that, don't don't open until after World War II. Um, we also like, this is the other thing I, so like when I talked about the two big sort of effects on economic growth in the 1920s, I said one is automobiles. The second is this sort of consumer revolution. Okay. And a lot of this has to do with being able to buy on credit, um, that for the very first time, um, at least in, in, in what in widespread, in a widespread manner, in a massive manner. Um, it becomes sort of the norm to be able to purchase things on credit. Uh, and so what we see is we, we see huge amounts. Of, so we see huge, like there's a bunch of things that sort of tie in here. We see huge amounts of, of, of um, or a huge increase in, in um, uh, average wages in America. So people just have more money. We see like a, a, a big increase uh, in technology. So we'll talk about like all like this, like the one part of this consumer revolution is just like all these new technologies that result f like from industrialization. So we start to see refrigerators, um, washing machines, irons, all these electronics. And a lot of that has to do with like the increased availability of electricity because we go from, you know, it's roughly like 20% of homes um, before World War One have um, electricity to nearly 70% do um, during the 1920s. So like there's a as more families have more electricity, it opens up markets to, you know, have silly things like, you know, dishwashers, vacuum cleaners, all those things that like make, uh, 
uh, life, you know, much more uh, in, enjoyable as far as not having to spend an enormous amount of time on, on household chores. But then I think like the most important part of this is just like, you know, people had credit. So like you didn't have to pay for everything up front. You could pay for things over the course of time and you think about how important that is um, for, uh, um, you know, purchases and maybe not purchases you guys have made yet because you I'm, I'm assuming that you haven't made many big purchases, but your parents probably rely on on um, the use of credit to pur purchase, uh, you know, big products. And I, I know I do. Um, so we just kind of talked about this, you know, like the, the changes in availability of electricity. We talked about the changes in wages. We talked about the changes in like these new products that come with electricity and like the increased industrialization. But I really want to make this note that like these changes really exclusively re like uh, affect uh, city life um, that rural populations really weren't um, affected by these I mean it's it's not really until the 1930s uh, that electricity gets spread to rural areas I mean you think about it during during the 1930s um, FDR uh, during the Great Depression had to pass an act uh, the rural it was literally called the rural uh, electrification act uh, to bring electricity to more rural areas and so um, this, this is going to, this, these economic changes between like rural lifestyles who largely are getting left behind. Um, and in many, in many cases, you can probably make the argument that, uh, for farmers, uh, the great depression really starts in the mid twenties. Uh, and, and so it, it creates this large gap, um, between sort of city lifestyles and rural lifestyles. Uh, and this is really kind of what we're like tying into next is that these, sort of social and cultural tensions during the 20s, it's it's not as simple as just like, hey, it's between rural people and uh, urban people, but in sort of a generalized way, that kind of helps us think about it. I mean, you can also like sort of divide lines between sort of very religious people and not religious people. You could, that, that uh, you know, non-religious people is maybe an overstatement. People who started to accept sort of scientific, um, understandings of, of the world um you know things like you 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 find this crazy but like in in the 1920s i mean there's a big debate between you know in sort of religious circles of um like what place is medicine going to have in, in in our world um you know is it is it god who's going to uh improve uh this uh, infection or, or is it antibiotics and, and they don't have antibiotics yet but that's that's a bad example but like as like medicines and in, in are started to develop for things like that that debate does become relevant um, we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, so it, there and even like so you could even talk about like the social gaps between immigrants and non-immigrants talk about social gaps and economic gaps between blacks and, and whites I mean all those things um, are important. Uh, one of the interesting things about the 1920s, so for the very first time, um, more Americans are going to live in cities, and that's what sort of like helps uh, make these tensions uh, sort of into big sort of cultural problems. Um, is that for the very first time in, in in American history, is that like we became more of uh, urban people than than sort of rural people. I mean, America had always been a, a nation. Uh, sort of uh, born on the backs of, of farmers in, in rural um, population. And so um, that's a very interesting change and a change that has a lot of important effects um, and, and really helps sort of increase this growing divide between different groups of people in, in America. Um, I think the other thing is um, if you look at uh, – you know, the economic parts of this, like I kind of mentioned before, and we're going to also talk about sort of like the dust bowl that happens and uh, um, develops and in, in how like farming problems are going to become very, very, um, sort of, uh, I mean, farmers are going to really struggle in the 20s. And you, you see this on the chart right in front of you is that, um, you know, uh, it, farming uh, at, wages are going to go up all the way to 1920. Um, and then we see sort of like with World War One ending, um, you know, just before that, that once the war is over, um, there's less of, of a uh, 
need for food, especially as European farmers start to get back on their feet. Um, and then there's a huge drop in, in, in uh, agricultural wages, and then they stagnate through the 1920s. They don't grow and they don't fall. They just kind of stay the same. And that, that's problematic because, I mean, inflation is ever-present in America in the 1920s. And so, like, um, if you look at those wages, um, you know, when you account for inflation, they're probably actually dropping. Um, and that's, I mean, that's at least half, if not more, um, than what, uh, you know, your average city worker was, was making at a time. And that's why when we talk, just talked about, you know, that for the first time there were more people living in cities, that's why people were moving to cities. They didn't necessarily, you know, this idea of the American dream wasn't totally true. Um, and, and city life, you know, like we talked about during the Gilded Age, um, that city life's not this great thing, you know, it's not this, uh, you know, the utopia in the cities, they're, they're living in, in, in terrible living conditions and, and many times really rough working conditions, um, but it does provide more money and more opportunity. Um, the other thing that is, is going to be important here is that there are going to be important differences that emerge in regards to, like, values, and a lot of this has to do with religion, um, and, and I, I think it's probably too strong to say that, like, you know, big portions of American population, like, moved away from religion. That's way too strong of saying that. But, like, that, well, in, in, in two things here. One is that as, as like, sort of scientific knowledge improves, um, that, like, the issue between, like, science and religion just become um, a bigger issue. We'll talk about, like, the teaching of evolution is a good example of how, like, this conflict between religion and science. We talk about med like the incorporation of in use of medicines. Um, talk about just like education in in, in general, um, and I and I think like that it's also about like the values associated with religion. When we talk about like social changes with women, um, we talk about drinking. It becomes a religious thing. Um, all of these issues are going to be um, ever present in the nineteen twenties. Uh, and there's groups of people that really sort of went along with what science was telling them about their world, and there were other people that, that didn't, and this sort of creates a, a, a gap, um, a very perceptible gap that I think in many ways we're still living with. I mean, I think it'd be insane to say that there's not a huge gap in American society between people that sort of cling to um, sort of traditional values and, and, and ideas that are sort of rooted in, in, in biblical uh, fundamentalism. And then other people who uh, are more willing to accept uh, worldviews uh, that you know come from outside of the Bible, um, from science, uh, and so this I, I think is really interesting because this is like the first time that you really start to to see this clash on a large scale. I mean, certainly uh, in smaller um, degrees, it's it, it always been sort of present, but. Um, in in large ways, it's 1920s is 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 a notable um, decade for that. Um, if if you look at this um, divide, there's also like I was sort of talking about this divide in education is that like city people are going to sort of see education as being essential for getting a good job. I also think that you you have to account that like city people also were were way 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 more concerned about education and, and mandatory schooling because of all the immigrants coming in, and I don't think you can discount that, is that, like, public schooling in, in big cities had a lot to do with, like, an Americanization of immigrants and making sure that you could sort of brainwash immigrants as they came into the country to get them to be, you know, model citizens in, in, in America. Um, but, I, 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 you know, in, in rural populations, you know, they, they kind of saw this idea of, of, of mandatory schools getting in the way of uh, interfering with farm work, um, and actually, in fact, like uh, the very sort of silly school day, the times of the school day, um, and our school calendar all revolve around farming, um, which I mean, still kind of shows like this initial sort of conflict, uh, in the beginnings of, of mandatory education. Um, so, um, you know, that, that's one of it. And, and I think like, Part of like the school debate also like has a lot to do with like what's being taught and how it's being taught. Uh, the for the very first time uh, in in the nineteen twenties we start to see evolution being um, taught in 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 in, uh, in a more widespread way. 
Um, and like I said, just kind of shows the increase of, of uh, scientific, um, you know, more and more people starting to uh, develop worldviews that weren't solely based on what the Bible says. Um, and so like, and this is like, I, I hope you see this the same thing today. I mean, like people fight so much about like how things are being taught and what's being taught in schools. Uh, you know, it's kind of crazy that, you know, like this is, um, you know, 90 years ago, uh, you know, they're, they're fighting about teaching evolution in schools and we're still sort of dealing with that as, as a population today. Um, but what happens in Tennessee is that they made it illegal to teach evolution in public schools. Um, the uh, biology teacher, uh, John Scopes, he taught, he decided he was going to teach evolution in the schools. Um, he, um, he was, uh, you know, he, he challenged it. Uh, and I think actually originally like they were going to, uh, fire him for it. And he, ch he sued in court and it goes all the way up the ladder and, um, Scopes was, uh, found guilty of teaching evolution in, in, in fine. And it's not really like the decision of the court here that's really important. Um, you know, like the actual like facts of the case really aren't that important. It's just like this is a really good example here of like how America was changing from a traditional, very sort of religious culture to a more secular, which just means like non-religious, um, modern culture. Um, and so... You know, many Americans, especially rural Americans, were very fearful of this shift in, in that was happening in America towards more secularism. You can see that, like, that they're making that point in that political cartoon there. Um, immigrants are also at the heart of like another uh, sort of cultural clash. And we talk about this, a lot of this stems um, back to uh, you know, the sort of anti-socialism, anti-immigration, like r Red Scare stuff. This nativism that sort of reappears after World War One, and, and, and I think in some ways, like as is a result of like that immigrants were both different. I mean, so you had a lot of Jews and a lot of like Catholics, uh, and a lot of Southern uh, Europeans pouring into the country. Um, but you also like part of it is like you can tie to World War One with like increased patriotism, um, the effects of like you know government propaganda and in and, and creating. Um, sort of in building American nationalism during World War One is all like having an impact on this. Um, and, and what the American government does is they they, they pass two acts. The, the first National Origins Act um, actually just like flat out limited the number of people that were, were coming into the country. And then in 1924, they actually set up quotas. Um, so like they went all the way back to like 18. So you can see from the chart here that like during the 1920s, immigration is going to drastically decrease. So like if you look at like early 1900s immigration levels and all the way to like where it drops in um, 1930s, uh, that like a lot of that has to do with these national origin acts. And what they did is they said like for each nationality, the quota, what it was is that 3% of the population um, of that was living in America of that nationality in 1890 could be let in. Um, and what's interesting is like, I mean, they didn't let any um, age. Actually, I take that back. Uh, they let like a small number of Filipinos in the country, but you know, for example, like they wouldn't let any Chinese or or um, uh, you know Japanese workers into the country. Um, they sure let. Uh, and then mostly like these quota acts were meant to uh, prevent immigration from Eastern and Southern European countries. So like they're trying to prevent like the increase of, of Catholics and Jews in, in, in America. Um, and this also sort of coincides with like a huge increase in, in the Ku Klux Klan. Um, the Ku Klux Klan makes a sort of, I don't know if you want to call it a comeback, but they, they, there's a resurgence in the Klan uh, uh, sort of beginning in, in World War One with like increased patriotism. And, but the Klan, so the Klan's going to keep sort of on their hateful ways with, 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 with minority groups, with, with African Americans, but they're also going to expand to like hating Jews and Catholics and just immigrants in, in general. Um, and it's going to get to the point like in 1925 where the Klan had somewhere between four and five million members. I've already talked about how like there was um, a Supreme Court uh, justice who was a Klan member and, and some of uh, the presidents during this time period were sort of suspected of being Klan members. Um, 
Um, and so like that just is indicative of, of like, again, like I told you, like 1920s is this sort of story of contradictions is, um, you know, we see change and we see reaction, you see change and you see reaction. Um, one of the big things that changes in, in, uh, I think the 18th amendment was passed in 1919. So this is actually right before the 1920s, but alcohol, alcoholic beverages were outlawed. Uh, with the 18th Amendment, so you need to know the 18th Amendment is prohibition. Um, so prohibition was supported much more in rural areas, um, not surprisingly, um, because rural uh, Protestants viewed sort of drinking as like an immigrant problem, and that like immigrants were coming into city American cities and becoming alcoholics and murderers and criminals and all that stuff that you know um, was associated with alcoholism. Um, the important thing to mention about prohibition in the 1920s, though, um, is that like prohibition didn't stop people from drinking alcoholic beverages. Is that uh, there are many thousands of these sort of illegal speakeasies uh, that develop all over the country. Um, many people, like gangst gangsters, are going to become incredibly rich uh, during the 20s and early part of the 30s, uh, bootlegging illegal liquor. I mean, people like Al Capone is like how Al Capone makes all his money is legal liquor, um, well, at least at first. Um, and so, like, the prohibition uh, really is a massive failure because it, it doesn't prevent people from drinking, um, and really it puts money uh, in the hands of criminals. Uh, and, and really, like, prohibition is going to be the um, sort of point at which like organized crime in America really dro grows drastically um, and that organized crime in, in, in America really sort of gets its foundations in um, prohibition and the sale of illegal liquor. Uh, you know, I, th I, th I think that, you know, it's, it's certainly worth sort of mentioning and, and, and at least thinking about like how this sort of relates to um, other uh, certain things that uh, you know, illicit products that are prohibited right now and how, you know, that sort of plays out in American society. Um, you know, sort of like before we kind of get into other sort of cultural things, like I said, I just kind of wrap this up. I mean, uh, you know, all these economic changes are important. Just understand that like they're, don't generalize these things, okay? Um, that you need to really understand like the nuances to this, uh, as we kind of move along um, to more like cultural and social things. So the 1920s and oftentimes is represents like the first decade of our sort of like modern sort of American culture. Um, for the first time we have sort of radios uh, and radio programming, we have um, movies. So um, it's, this is the time in which like Hollywood develops. Um, and we also see like differences in, in American literature that's developed. Um, and a lot of this ties to increased uh, leisure time. It also in, in, is tied to obviously people just had had not only had more time but had more money. Um, so they look for new ways to entertain themselves. And so like movies become probably the most popular form. Um, you know, movie you could go see a movie for five cents uh, at at the time. And so uh, this becomes a very popular way for Americans to sort of spend their free time and their money. Uh, and and so during the nineteen twenties. Um, you have like the first movie stars like Charlie Chaplin, um, and, and by 1927 you have the first, uh, you know, what was called a talkie. Uh, in 1927 was the first, um, you know, ended silence films, and then it, uh, I don't remember the exact year, but I mean, you all know the movie Wizard of Oz was Wizard of Oz was was uh, one of the first, uh, it maybe was the first color uh, movie made. Uh, talk about radio and, and um, you know radio programming. Um, you have soap operas that developed during the 1920s. The reason that then soap operas started on radios and the reason they're called soap operas is because soap companies would be like the advertising. So like you'd hear this radio show um, and then like it would say, this show is brought to you by XYZ, you know, soap company, whatever. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting thing that, that the soap operas start on, on radios. Um, we also see a huge growth in professionalized sports, and, and that's, that's baseball, but it's also boxing. 
um, is, is another really uh, important sport that becomes very popular in the 1920s. Um, but people like Babe Ruth become wildly popular in the 20s. Uh, and, you know, baseball was really the sport, you know, in many ways. Like, baseball was the, you know, like football is today. Um, some other sort of things, uh, as far as cultural goes, like Lindbergh becomes a big sort of cultural hero. Um, he becomes the first man to, uh, f uh, fly, fly solo across the Atlantic. Um, I don't know how important that is. We're going to jump across that. Um, women also are going to experience a number of important changes in their 1920s. Uh, so like we'll talk about how they married later. Uh, a lot of this had to do with, uh, you know, having more economic freedom, more opportunities as individuals. They had fewer children. Uh, they generally lived longer and had healthier lives. And in part, maybe could be in, in some ways because of these labor saving appliances that are developed. Um, and, and just again to note, like these women, they, these changes for women really were mostly, um, for rural or sorry, urban women. Um, instead of rural women. We also see like what was like a trend called uh, the flappers. And so uh, a younger generation of women really rejected sort of like the traditional, um, you know, morality and values of, of women and sort of like that women uh, had a specific place in society. So like flappers were known to like cut their hair short. Uh, they were sort of... Um, <laughs> thought of like scandalous because they uh wore um you know like you know skirts that would show their knees and in instead of you know wearing the the you know the full length dresses they would dance um you know as single women uh instead of um you know you know the, and that was like scandalous they would go out and they would drink and, and and they would smoke and like all these things were seen as like being very um, on ladylike and they're you know so it's the flappers really reject like represented this rejection of, of traditional sort of norms and values um, women are also going to see a bunch of other firsts okay so um, they're able to obviously we talked about like the 19th amendment that was passed in 1919 so women are now like voting um, you're going to see the first female um, women elected the u.s senate you're going to see first female governors um, you're going to see women expand into a, a, a bunch of different uh, fields in the 1920s um, as the economy continues to grow, uh, especially in cities. Um, and so, like, women do experience a number of important changes. Um, I don't know how much I want to talk about this stuff. We're going to actually come back to this. I'll have a separate kind of talk on this. But um, you need to understand, like the like culture during the culture and literature, art, all that stuff in the 1920s really was strongly affected by World War One, and like how like World War One uh, really like caused people to question a, a number of things about society, and like um, you know we start to see different forms of art um, and experimentation. When we talk about literature, like uh, we talk about like the writers of the Lost Generation. You know, with with Hemingway uh, and F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, uh, you so like these, like I said, we're gonna come back to this, um, but like this lost generation uh, is is important, and then I think like something I didn't really mention is that uh, you know this is sort of like the the starting point where like existentialism really starts to to grow from, um, and a lot of that also is like tied to some like the developments in science too but uh, that's for another class um so let's talk about some uh stuff uh with the harlem renaissance here at the very end of this slideshow so um the harlem renaissance also happens in the 1920s and the harlem renaissance really is a res is is this sort of growth of of a uniquely black culture um in, in a uniquely black culture that has pride in in being black uh and so this is really a result of, of a couple of things. So like World War One and the Great Migration and how like during World War One and, and during this Great Migration, like millions of, of African Americans are going to relocate from, from rural parts of the South uh, where they're sort of facing very violent um, discrimination to urban parts of the North. And when they get into urban parts of the North, it's not to say that they weren't segregated because they were. And a lot of this is why like they become uh, African-Americans become highly concentrated in certain parts of large cities. But 
um, this sort of concentration of, of black populations in these cities really leads to this sort of flowering of, of black culture and uniquely black culture that really becomes American culture in some ways. And like when we talk about like jazz music um, being probably the best example of, of that. Um, but, you know, if we look at this sort of good and going back to like the, the great migration is that like, you know, move the movement of, of, of millions of, of African Americans from sort of the, the poverty and, and racism in the South and hoping for some better wages and, and, and better treatment in the North. And, and like, again, I'm going to go back to this, like discrimination did exist in the North. Um, and African Americans, you know, faced low pay, poor housing and, and threats of race riots. I mean, like I said, there's a huge race riot that breaks out in Chicago, uh, for example, uh, because some, some black kids wanted to, to swim on a white beach, um, which it seems ridiculous. But, um, you know, a race riot breaks out over that. And, and it, um, uh, I actually think that in that, in that uh, you'd have to look this up, but I actually think like a, a white uh, man uh, threw a, a rock at a, at a black kid and killed him maybe. I don't know. There's, there, there's some story to that. Um, if we talk about sort of Harlem specifically, uh, you know, Harlem becomes sort of like the focal point of migration uh, to New York and, and becomes sort of like the black community uh, in, in New York. Um, and uh, this is, so like when we, we talk about sort of like the outgrowth of, of black culture, um, you know, there's, there, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to get to like specific examples. I, I kind of hate that I put this slide here. Um Marcus Garvey is, I don't know, like, blah, you know, um, you know, like W.E.B. Du Bois is going to call like, like this, uh, like Garvey and like his back to Africa movement, like the most dangerous enemy of the Negro race and like how like this, like really was, um, you know, he, what he wanted to do is like, um, uh, like support black owned businesses and black nationalism, which is great. Um, but he also like founded the Back to Africa movement, um, which was not so sweet, um, and 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 really tried to push for for blacks to to leave um, and and go back uh, to Africa. Um, then, so a couple things uh, from when we talk about the. Uh, Above you. I wonder if I can go back. All right, there we go. Uh, you, I'm, so like, I think like the two, and what's interesting about this is like, I mean, like jazz is going to begin in, 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 in the South with, with, with African Americans. And I mean, a lot of actually like jazz, uh, many of the jazz, important jazz artists in, in early, I mean, come from Mississippi, which is cool. Um, but so like jazz starts as what was considered like black music. And becomes so popular that like it becomes like American music, and and really until like rock and roll, like you know, um, many people around the world sort of scoffed at American culture, but jazz is something that becomes like gains worldwide popularity, um, and becomes sort of like this, uh, you know, sort of like the the picture of American culture and American music becomes jazz, which is interesting because it was, I mean, it's. it's I mean, it's black culture that it, that becomes sort of like the the culture that the rest of the world celebrates from America uh, during this time period. Um, we start to see like better, um, uh, you know, and in, in more prolific um, um, examples of of like African American writing. Um, see, like I talk about Zora Neale Hurston on the next slide, um, but. Uh, you know, Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston are probably the best. Like Langston Hughes in poetry is is awesome. I'll have an example of this on the next slide. Um, but you know, it, Langston Hughes is really interesting because um, his he was uh, sort of uh, mixed race racially, um, and so he talked a lot about like a lot of his poetry has to do with race and sort of like the problems of race and like who he was, and it, it it's really uh, exceptional. Um, writing. Um, Zora Neale Hurston is really interesting because um, her writing was 
she she wrote in a manner in which like African Americans would have talked, and so like a lot of her stories are interesting to read because they're essentially in like you know Southern African American slang language that had developed um, at that you know during that time period uh, and had been developing for a long time at that point, um, and so her sort of very uniquely um, written literature uh, in the sort of like language that people would have spoken is really cool to read. Um, so this is an example of a Langston Hughes um, poem. He says, my old man's a white old man and my old mother's black. If I ever curse my old, my white old man, I take my curses back. If I ever I curse my black old mother and, and wish her, wish she were in hell, I'm sorry for that evil wish and now I wish her well. My old man died in a fine big house. My ma died in a shack. I know where I'm going to die, but he neither white nor black. So I was saying like a lot of this poetry is going to have to deal with like, like what is race? What is white? What is black? And all the, those, those questions um, sort of revolving around race. Um, and sort of like to end here, uh, you know, as the Great Depression began, the Harm Renaissance came to end. We're going to talk about sort of like the, the Great Depression, the New Deal is what we'll start next week with. Um, but you sort of look at like, the effects of the Harlem Renaissance, like the, you, I really like the sense of group identity and solidarity among African Americans, and then like, like in some sense, like for the very first time, uh, in 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 big way, in big cultural uh, ways um, across the country, and in ways that really tie different parts of the country, like you have a real sense of like African American pride and Black pride, um, and like that, like this Harlem Renaissance becomes sort of this cultural bedrock that, like, I really think. Um, is is the foundation from like which the civil rights movement is going to be built uh, in the 1960s, um, and really like the, the great when the Great Depression starts in, in the 1930s, I mean it puts all these sort of like cultural changes on hold uh, because you, know, you have all this change in the 1920s, and then you have basically like a 10 year period where we're in this depression and, and things really stagnate and don't change, and then you have you know five years of World War II. Um, and then, you know, in 1945, um, a lot of the changes that had been happening in the 1920s picked back up, picked back up again. Um, and so just remember that when we get to like all these changes that are going to have to happen after World War II, a lot of this is, is tied to things that were really started in the 20s.